Welcome to another edition of Everyone Hates Cleveland, the podcast, of course, now hosted by Waiting for Next Year. That's right. We're part of the Waiting for ne Next Year, I don't know, radio network. Maybe I should coin that. Craig, if you hear this, I'm coining that. That's my phrase. The Waiting for Next Year radio network, podcast network, whatever you want to say. Uh, joined today by my co-host, as always, Michael Hattery, and we have lots and lots and lots of Indians news after an off-season of really nothing uh, we have to talk about. Edwin Encarnacion today, uh, the Indians making a huge, huge three-year signing um, for $60 million, which really turns into $65 million. I'll let Mike talk about that in a second. Uh, we also need to talk Michael Brantley news as quote-unquote breaking news from Jonah Carey came out yesterday in a little soundbite of his. And uh, a bunch of other things, Greg Allen getting a lot of noise. Uh, we'll talk about Greg Allen, we'll talk about the outfield, and also want to talk a little bit about Mark Shapiro. Of course, with Chris Antonetti and Mark Shapiro kind of in the mix with this deal, uh, and of course Atkins as well, former all former or current Indians front office people, uh, a lot of flack is being thrown at Mark Shapiro. I want to kind of get into that today as well. Uh, you know, the Indians front office has been a point of contention or a point of love. <laughs> It's Christmas season. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit too. But let's start off with the big news, the news that kind of broke the bank this week, Mike. Uh, the Indians went out and we speculated on this in our last podcast, and I think mocked it. Uh, the Indians went out and did something that they've never done before. They made a player a $20 million man. I don't know. I, I Off the top of my head, I'm not sure who, who made the – who's made the biggest money in Indians history. It may be, I don't, it may, I don't, I don't we can get into that in a second, but uh, first thoughts, Mike, you had the story out almost first, if not first for WFNY. Uh, it, it's been a couple of days. I, I don't know that our thoughts have changed on this, but how big a deal is this move for the Indians uh, as far as on the field and, and really the off the field kind of on top of what they did last July uh, this is definitely a new frontier for Cleveland Indians fans. And, of course, this front office um, has kind of unveiled itself as being aggressive when they can be. Yeah, it's a whole mess of things. The, the Indians have made two deals this year, the first one, Miller, and this one, Encarnacion, where I think the entire sort of organizational perception has changed. But I think that's partially because we really weren't listening. You know, I think the Dolans – you know, talked about the fact that they were ready to push the chips in as income. You know, they were going to reinvest in the team. And this is the first time they make it deep in the playoffs. They gather, garner significant revenue, though we can argue about what that revenue actually looks like. I don't think we have a clear picture. Um, but they garner significant revenue and they go add from outside. And what's really cool about the Indians having this sort of opportunity to add from outside for a below market deal is that they get to upgrade offensively without sort of mortgaging the future, selling the future for now, you know, and dealing a Diaz, a Zimmer, an Allen, um, a McKenzie, and other assets, or a Mejia. And they still can deal one or two of those guys, but the Indians brought in a legit top 10 hitter in baseball from the past half decade and didn't give up any significant assets except for a late first-round pick, um, which to me, when they get a compensatory second-round pick, actually isn't that costly because they made up most of the bonus allotment pool there. So you're just sliding back into the second. So I actually think this is just incredible situationally and sort of helps them keep the window open a little longer um, because they're allocating uh, just financially, you know, income and revenue rather than allocating prospects, which are their usual currency. You know, and on several levels, you know, you talked about the draft pick compensation the Indians, I think, of late have been really good at managing their pull money. Obviously, their pull money drops substantially with losing that first pick, but I think they have done a really nice job of manhandling the later rounds. We're going to get into one of those guys in Greg Allen in a little bit, um, but I think I think they are confident now in their their draft process, where I think they can compensate for that by perhaps getting a couple of steals later in the rounds, as they have done over the past years. I think the other thing too, Mike. I mean, you mentioned uh, getting a deal for Encarnacion, and I think I think the the interesting piece to this deal before we get into how it affects the lineup and how it affects the Indians going forward and how it affects even the future of this franchise going into 2018 uh, and a p potentially a potential non Carlos Santana year, 
but I think the interesting thing to me is is I think the market value, um, they, they paid market value for him, $20 million a year. That's what he was looking for. He was looking for four years. The Indians give it to him in, in, a, in three. And you said something very interesting to me off air uh, on Thursday after the deal went through that this really isn't a three and 60 deal. It's really potentially a three and 65 deal or actually a four and 80 deal if he's still hitting. So I ask you, Mike, um, you know, they didn't get a market deal in that they just cut a year off this deal and they really gave him a four year contract if he ends up hitting until he's, you know, 38 years old, which we can talk about in a second. But so one, I think, I think it's interesting because they were playing with the big boys and that they gave up big boy money. One, Two, if all the rumors are true, and I, I haven't really been reading up on this with travel and stuff, you know, I'm hearing that the A's actually offered a little more than the Indians, a better location, you know, I, as far as weather goes. You know, you hear about these little ta- intangible things that keep people from Cleveland. It appears as though the Indians not only had a lower bid, and, and I guess that's a point of contention, but not only did they potentially have a lower bid, but they – Encarnacion wanted to come here. Now that's a twofold thing. I mean, obviously he wants to come here because, you know, they lost to us in the playoffs and almost won the World Series. I mean, that's got to be a, a tangible reason. As you mentioned, the window's going to be open now for three, four, five years. The thing to this, Mike, is the relationship building that the Indians have been working on long before uh, Chris Antonetti, uh, the Mark Shapiro era, even the John Hart era, the Hank Peters era. I mean, going clear back to the late 80s. This has been a franchise that has been built on building relationships. It seems as though that relationship building with Encarnacion over the past couple of weeks paid off. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, are, the Indians are now kind of swinging the bat like a big boy again, kind of like they were doing in the 90s. This is not me trying to comp the Indians now to the Indians of the 90s, but it does seem like they are on an even playing field. Yeah, and I think the relationship aspect you talked about is a really good lead into another conversation we're going to have today. I thought you were leading me there, and then you you brought it back, which is just why, it's why you're an elite podcast host, and I'm I'm the guest. Uh, but you know, I think the Indians are phenomenal at this, and I think a lot of people forget the part in the Francona story where Francona is hired as basically a special assistant and Shapiro and Antonetti take time to help him prepare for managerial interviews uh, and eventually getting the Boston job. And I think that's one of the really special things. I think it's just emblematic of the organization. And so while there may be criticisms about the Indians ability to spend money as an organization, when you see them win, what was it? Uh, PR department of the year, manager of the year, GM of the year. This is an organization that's really wide, widely respected in the league. And you can criticize those awards or argue about them, but they're respected in the league. And that's the reality. And I think that's a huge part of, uh, of this, you know, playing here, you know, there's criticism about having to play here in April and I get it. It's freezing cold. I know Ichiro never wanted to do it and that's fine. I never wanted to watch him play here anyway. Uh, but, you know, I think this is an organization that players really trust and that people who have been around baseball want to be a part of. And, and the you know, this and, time and, spent the money that could make it work. Yeah, well, I, it's it, talent-wise too, you know, when you just look at the, the, the personnel on this team, there's a very likable team with, with, you know, they don't really have those irascible players that you hear about. And, and Encarnacion kind of fits into that category as well. Seems to be a good clubhouse guy. Uh, doesn't have that Batista kind of aura about him. Uh, you know, when people were talking about free agents coming here, you know, Batista was mentioned as well, but he, he seems to fit in a whole different category. Now let's look at, you know, let's, b- before we dive into anything else, let's look at the meat and potatoes of this. Uh, Mike Encarnacion obviously brings um, something that's been long coveted by many Cleveland Indians fans, something that Mike Napoli brought with him to a certain extent. But Encarnacion comes at a completely different level as a power bat from the right-handed side. I mean, he singularly changes this entire lineup. You and I have been preaching, trying to lengthen the lineup over the years. Uh, Last year was tough with Michael Brantley being out. But adding Encarnacion with or without Brantley – um, does lengthen this lineup in, in a variety of different ways. I mean, obviously, we don't have to talk about a number four hitter because he's there, and that's going to be where he hits as long as he's healthy. I also think he's going to primarily play DH, although I'm sure he'll 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 be at first base on occasion, dependent on what the Indians do down the line. But Mike, I mean, you know, 
let's assume, you know, we'll get into Brantley in a second, but let's assume that Brantley isn't healthy. Let's assume that the lineup looks similar to last year. Plugging in Carnacion into this lineup in front of what I can only assume would be, you know, a similar looking team as last year. Without Brantley, that would look like, a, a you know, probably Santana leading off without having Rajai Davis. And we'll get into that in a second because, like I said, we're going to mention Greg Allen. But Santana leading off, probably, you know, Lindor hitting second. Or I'm sorry, I take that back. Kipnis hitting second, Lindor hitting third. You now plug in Carnacion in behind those guys. And we're talking about OBP guys right around 350 or above. Uh, and then behind him, you're likely putting J Ram there uh, unless you surprisingly get a, you know, I don't know, a Gomes hitting better uh, or somebody else maybe surprising or maybe another moves in the mix that we don't know about or Michael Brantley. And we'll get into him and how he may affect the lineup or will he affect the lineup in a second. Uh, he lengthens this lineup in a very interesting way, but but Mike, give us give us the nuts and bolts of this. Why is Edwin Encarnacion? <laughs> this is kind of a loaded question. I, I don't want to give you angst, but I'm going to ask the question anyways. Why is Edwin Encarnacion better than <laughs> Mike Napoli? Um. Because he makes contact. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can still give you pause because now you're you're. Your very analytical mind is like so many things are pounding at it right now. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> so no, so this is the thing that's really awesome. And you mentioned it with the OBP at the top, but you know, you imagine you get Santana on 35 to 37% of the time, or Kipnis gets on 34 to 36% of the time. And then the middle of the order, you have Lindor and Carnacion and Ramirez hitting three through five, and none of those guys are going to strike out more than 18% of the time, which is better than league average. And Lindor is going to strike out like 12% of the time. Ramirez is going to strike out like 10% of the time. You have elite guys at making contact. And then, oh, you added a guy who hits 40 homers, but also can make contact and take walks. It just really sort of builds on the contact and OBP skills that the top has where you're missing less opportunities that Napoli was missing. Napoli was great last year in the first half. I don't want to be a jerk about Napoli. I mean, he did phenomenal work in the first half, career high in homers. Great. But I think we really saw how tough it could be for that lineup to score at times when your four hitter can't hit anything that isn't nailed down. <laughs> and, uh, and Carnacion is not going to have that problem. Yeah, I, you know, and I, I think a couple of things to consider here too. And you've heard ringing um, of this sounding a little like the Nick Swisher deal. You know, both come in here tail end of thirty three, start of thirty four. You can probably throw Napoli into that equation as well. People worrying about longevity and and can he continue? But I think level wise, you're talking about a guy who's been at the upper level. Um, of his game really from the get-go. I mean, he's been in the MVP talk over the past five seasons with Toronto. His career's really, really developed. I mean, this is a guy who's entering uh, his 30, age 34 year, but we're talking about a guy who's been in the All-Star game three out of the past four seasons, and in the year he didn't make the All-Star team, he still, he still hit 39 home runs, had 111 RBIs, uh, had a 370 OBP. This is a guy who struck out over 100 times only for the second time in his career last year, it, which is why some people are considering it a down year. It dropped his OPS down, uh, it, but we're still talking about, you know, as far as, you know, as far as metrics, I mean, if you want to just look at the basic metrics that people understand, we're still talking about a four war player at the at bare minimum. I mean, do you see diminished returns here? I mean, we are talking about our primary DH. I think the Indians are going to take care of him by putting him at the DH position to perhaps, I don't know, maybe keep him from maybe getting injured or maybe maybe doing something that, that may maybe cause his play to diminish at the tail end of the year. But there's been nothing. Has you, have you seen anything, Mike, in, in your you know, kind of detailing him over the past couple of days and really the past couple of weeks since we started talking about him? Have you seen anything that would lead you to believe that he's going? we're going to see some diminishing returns from him uh, as the year progresses just simply because he's going to turn 34? Um, the K-rate increase – Last year was a thing that is mildly concerning, but it also was still above average. So when you're sort of like, and he is so much power and, and sort of plate discipline, that's not an issue. Um, obviously there's the aging curve concern that we're going to throw on anybody, but even if you sort of like create an aggressive aging curve where we say, okay, maybe he's just a three war player next year. 
a DH instead of a four to five war player, which he's been for the past five years. That's still a significant upgrade, and that would be cost per win worth about $27 million, $26 million, and that means they're going to pay him 20 so they're getting surplus. So they get the front end of the deal, they're certainly going to get surplus, and that's why it's awesome to have a three-year deal. If they get surplus the first two years, the third year is not important. Heaven forbid he actually be productive into his late 30s, which – isn't impossible. I mean, we've seen Beltron productive to nearly 40. The aging curve affects everybody differently. So the Indians have the option to get even more sort of surplus if it fits or if it doesn't, he walks. Um, and that's fine too. So I think I don't expect massive regression, you know, over the course of the deal. I mean, at the end of the deal, I think third year could be messy. We'll see what it looks like, but I'm not worried about it in 2017. Well, you mentioned Beltron and I think that's a great comp in that. And, and especially when you consider, you know, when Beltron was playing for the Mets, I mean, he was still playing in the field. You know, we've got a guy that we legitimately can control by putting him in the DH position. And, you know, the foresight of this front office, Mike, what they've really done here in many ways, and, and uh, this is not the only thing they've done. I mean, obviously they were trying to answer several questions heading in, not several. <laughs> they didn't have several questions. I, I'm, I got to get rid of my old Indian speak here. They're answering their major question with this, um, Encarnacion deal this year, but I think in the long run, they clearly were looking down the road to replace a guy like Carlos Santana, uh, more the DH side of him than anything else. I still think, you know, depending on what they do with Santana at the end of this year, and I don't want to jump ahead, we got too much to talk about with this year coming up, but it, this was a, a, a move to protect themselves heading into next year, don't you think, Mike? I mean, this does give them their built in replacement for Carlos Santana should they have development from other players elsewhere and they, they, they don't necessarily need to go out and get a guy to, to take his place at first base next year. But this does address his bat in many, many, many ways. They now have Encarnacion who can fill in for him. And of course, this year we get both of them, whereas next year we may have some developing players offensively who take his place at Bradley Zimmer, potentially Greg Allen, Andy Diaz, and we'll get into them in a second. But this is that, that front office kind of being proactive, don't you think? Yeah, I think so. And I, I also think, and we're going to, I think we're going to go to Michael Brantley next, because I, I think that the Encarnacion deal may be more, may have more relevance to Brantley's future than we think. And I think there are some implications to the Encarnacion deal in terms of Brantley only has what, after 2017? I believe. I think, wait, say, say that. I, are you talking about contract? I believe. Yeah, it's. I think. I think this is. He's got one year left with with an option after that. Okay, so I think to me this is sort of reflective of we. You know, Santana and Brantley both may walk. They may not believe in Brantley, but even if they think he can be productive this year, I think it's they don't want to take the long term risk on betting on Brantley again, perhaps. But I think this is where we have to talk about Brantley. Well, Um, I mean, I I mean, I I definitely think it is a proactive. Yeah, I just, you know, just real quick, you know, just kind of looking at, I'm just kind of looking at his contract right here. Um, he's got, let me see here. Hold on. My, my computer literally just froze on me. Um, he's got, uh, I'll edit this out. Yeah. So he's got uh, 2017, 8.3 million. And then he's got the 2018 team option, uh, $11 million with the $1 million buyout. I think the thing that's interesting to that is I was talking to Jeff Nomina off the air a couple days ago. And, you know, you know, when you look ahead, you know, if Brantley isn't back and, and I'm going to let you talk about that in a second, but if Brantley isn't back in, two, you know, in 2017 and there's legit concerns, you literally can dump the $11 million salary by not picking up his option and use that money um, and of course there's some, you know, compensation for other players that we've got, you know, I don't want to think about that yet, but in theory, you could re-sign Carlos Santana to a bigger deal because you'd be losing, uh, Brantley's 11 million, but I digress. Um, go ahead, Mike, talk a little bit about Brantley as, as, as this kind of segue, you know, from at Encarnacion here, uh, you know, with the Jonah Carey stuff coming out. I mean, this isn't news. I mean, he's got a shoulder injury. I know it's not his throwing arm, but when you're talking about a guy whose relevance as an MVP candidate, as an offensive leader on this team, is dependent on power, um, and and not only dependent on power. I mean, we talk about we've talked about his IQ a bazillion times, but you know, whenever you talk about a shoulder injury, it doesn't matter how dramatic a shoulder injury it is. When you're 
28, 29, 30 years old and you have a shoulder injury, whether you're a player on the field or whether you're a pitcher, obviously, I mean, that's a big deal. We found that out with Travis Hafner. Uh, is this a surprise to you at all, Mike? One, two, is it even more serious than you thought? I mean, his nomina has been pounding at me and pounding at you over the past week. They had to move a muscle from one part of his body to another, which cracks me up every time because, yeah, yeah, that sounds pretty important. Um, Jonah Carey wasn't breaking any – we've gotten no new news, right? I mean, this is just what we've been hearing. I mean, you have eyes. We have ears. We've, we bitched and moaned last year about the call-ups and send-downs and he's healthy, no, he's not, and no, they rushed him back, and we talked about this last March. This isn't a surprise, is it? I don't think it's a surprise, but I actually think it was sort of a useful message to Indians fans in terms of like what you should expect long term. Uh, like, I don't think it was in any way surprising, but I think we haven't really been honest enough about the fact that we might be watching Brantley go the way of Travis Hafner or Grady Sizemore. And that really sucks. Um, so I, I don't think it's particularly new. I, there was another, uh, Jeff Zimmerman from Fangraphs, who does really wonderful sort of research on injuries and their long-term implications, talked about the fact that he thinks ultimately Brantley's on projected big league baseball player. And, and it's really unfortunate, but I think it makes us more responsible in having the conversation that I think this is the something we didn't, this is the thing we didn't want to talk about. Brantley being hurt and probably never being a productive asset again is the thing we didn't want to talk about. And so having to have that conversation. Yeah. Kerry's not breaking any news. The guy has had multiple surgeries on his left arm. He played five games last year. He's in his thirties now. Like that's a big deal. We all knew that. And it's his left shoulder. And it's also, you know, if you look at sort of how you drive power, your left hand, when you're a left-handed hitter is sort of important and getting power from the left arm. So, you know, and it, and this, we need to have a secondary conversation about the whole rehab process. But I mean, I think that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a rabbit hole, man. It's dark down there. That's a rabbit hole. I mean, if uh, that's a rabbit hole, that's a whole podcast that we've, we've gotten into that a little bit in the past, Mike. And, you know, they've, we, you know, they've, they've handled, I think, you know, rehab in an interesting way with certain players over the past few years. And, you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to get in. I'm, I'm not in a front office, and I'm not sitting on the field with the Cleveland Indians. So I, I'm not ready to talk about that with brevity. But I do think that's something we do need to talk about down the road because, you know, I, whether it was Brantley or whether it was the Indians and the he said she said and the why did he wait so long and why did he come back so fast and, you know, when you really sit down and think about it and you think about the way this front office handles its business. The one thing that doesn't fit for many years, it was the drafting. And now you have to ask, it's, is it the way they've been handling their, 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 their rehab process? You know, we, we can talk about the Danny Salazar process over the years and how they handled him. And then when you compare it to this, it's just insane to me um, that we're talking about perhaps a, a condition that developed over the span of 18 months that started because, the franchise wasn't either able to get him to have the right kind of surgery initially or whether they didn't push it or whether they didn't suggest it or whether they said he shouldn't have the surgery. It just, and from that point on, it just seemed to be a cavalcade of errors. And it does seem like you can point to a couple of different scenarios where that happened. Uh, Jan Gomes being another, but that again is for another day. I, you know, the front office is too good. The the management team has been too good to to kind of go down that road and, and they've been making so many goods this moves this year i don't that has to be its own podcast and we'll get into that you know probably between now and march but you know mike i i guess if we look at michael brantley in this regard you know if we look at him as icing on the cake and and you know that he's going to resume swinging here in a week um within the week you know if he's back in any form of his old self. And let's say that he doesn't have the power. Let's say that he is a singles hitter, but still with the same contact and IQ. And maybe, maybe he isn't in the field anymore. And, and while that would pose a problem with Encarnacion and Santana, I think, you know, the reality is, is maybe he's a part-time player. I, you know, and this is kind of a bare minimum. I, I think the, the window with Brantley next year is, is, is a mystery. It's a shrouded window. We don't know how open it's going to be. And we don't know how, how into the, you know, lineup he's going to be until we see some production and we see some health from him but if he's healthy at all 
and you add him to our lineup, as it stands, if the Indians don't make any current moves for any players outside the organization, um, that does, even maybe in a 100-game scenario, um, that does make some interesting conversations because you do make, if he's, again, if he's a 300 hitter, if he's, even if he's not a 300 hitter, but he's still kind of that old guy, a guy who can get on base, a guy who can knock guys around by hitting a single here or there when you need him to be, maybe in that old school, like 70s vein of like a 40-year-old guy who you keep around because he can make contact. Um, that does give us an interesting, perhaps even playoff lineup where you have a guy who you can lengthen that lineup into, you know, a seven, a seven member crew. And that's not taking into anybody else into account. We haven't talked about Yandy yet. We haven't talked about Greg Allen yet. And we haven't talked about other moves that they potentially could make. Uh, but doesn't, aren't they now sort of, it seems like while the Indian franchise is kind of, they, they don't, haven't really talked a lot about this, but they're kind of steering us towards icing on the cake with Brantley, aren't they? I think so. <laughs> That's not a long answer, but you gave such like a detailed analysis that sometimes your questions should just be answered. <laughs> That's a so great way to say, damn it, Jim, you ramble a lot. <laughs> Correct. I, I own that. I concur with your analysis. I own that. But okay, so um, so go ahead, Mike. That's just okay. We can stop. So I'll, I'll cut, cut all that out. Um, all right. So Brantley, let, let's kind of veer it back towards Encarnacion, and and let's say that the signing was partially because of Brantley. It does. And you mentioned this, you, you kind of touched upon this earlier, Mike, with the Indians having lots of value still from the lack of trading for Jonathan LaCroix. You mentioned Mejia, you mentioned, um, we've mentioned Greg Allen, Yandy, we've mentioned all the players that were involved in that LaCroix deal and, and then some. I'm not proposing that the Indians make a trade. That is not what I'm doing. It is interesting to me, though, that this Encarnacion deal does in many ways leave the Indians in kind of the catbird seat and that they don't have to make a deal. As you've mentioned off air, if you, as you mentioned on air, without Encarnacion, the Indians right now are a World Series team. Now with Encarnacion, they're still that World Series team with an added bat who's going to be better than Mike Napoli next off, their next playoffs. Uh, if he's healthy. So they're in the catbird seat, Mike, in, in, in that they they can now be the team sitting back having teams call them. I, one scenario I threw at you just kind of off the cuff was the Rockies who were kind of in on Encarnacion, if you believe the rumors. I don't buy that. But and this is a team that didn't get Encarnacion, realizes that the Indians have surplus uh, in the minor league system. They obviously were making a, a swing deal for LaCroix last year. Could could the Indians be in a position now where they're just or Antonetti and Chernoff can sit back and have teams call them and say, "Hey, you've got Encarnacion. Would you be willing to part with?" Couldn't the Indians maybe fall into a deal at, at this point? And 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 even taking that into account, Mike, I guess what I'm really getting into is really where the Indians are now is this. Uh, aren't they really just loaded for bear heading into July? And if they need somebody, they can go get them. Yeah. Yeah, I think. And this is like a classic Jim and Mike. This is a classic Jim and Mike conversation. We've always fallen just like a little bit separate. Uh, but we've. Ne I don't think we've ever actually had the chance to fall that separate because we've never been in a situation where the Indians were this clearly the best team in their division, perhaps <laughs> the best team in the American League. Maybe last year. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, this is the first time where it's established and locked. And, you know, I think I'm someone who is um, too conservative for my age with regards to aggression. Uh, Jim and I play age opposites when it comes to this conversation. Yeah. As always, you know, like I definitely think there has to be a deal for a center field out, field, fielder out there that doesn't hurt you that much. Um, and I agree in that regard. You know, you have the Mets who are trying to move an outfielder. Lagaris is super cheap and plays great defense. If they just wanted to go with an elite defender who can kind of do nothing in the nine hole, I don't care. That's fine with me. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of cool routes for them to go. But I just sort of like the, you know, I think when you're this clearly the best team and the, the playoffs are such a crapshoot, it's like really hard for me to be like, oh, let's move perhaps like, 
when guys who can help you keep that window open, especially like Allen, Allen and Zimmer, I'm actually pretty against dealing them at this point because you have such a loaded roster and then, you know, they can immediately supplement almost, um, which, you know, makes dealing for a center fielder even harder because they're saying, how much do I want to allocate there when I think I have two guys who could potentially fill that role in the next six months. So I don't know. I definitely think there's a deal out there. I just don't want to see them go give up too much to upgrade that position. Well, I mean, it almost feels like if you're going to make a deal, like the guy that you would go and get would be a guy like Ender and Ciarte only because, you know, he's a young guy. He's a guy who you'd control for a long period of time. And the Braves more or less answered that question by offering him a five and 30 deal to kind of wrap him up and, and likely not trade him. You know, I, I, you know, you, you don't want to, you know, it, I talked about several guys, Pollock being one of them. He's probably, if you're going to hit the home run, he's the guy you go for. They've got control for two years, but seems to me that this while aggressive, the Indians aren't going to potentially give up uh, an Allen Zimmer, you know, rise, you know, to this team perhaps in July, you know, when with for only two years of Pollock, that doesn't seem to be what they'll do. However, the flip side of that coin is how aggressive they've been. I mean, they literally went for a third catcher with LaCroix and I, I'm going to call him the third catcher just because that's where I'm at with him. But that move to me was the one that then makes this hazy for me. This is the one that gives me a chance to argue. Cause like you said, I, and the flip side of this argument is I'm much more liberal. You know, if they have a, with this, with this particular thing, where I think if, if there's a home run out there, you go and get it. Now, my, my torn heart here is that I love Greg Allen, and I think I truly believe that Greg Allen has superstar potential. I'm so sick of listening to quote-unquote experts talk about his low ceiling based on the simple fact that Greg Allen came out of college polished. I mean, let's look at the fact. Okay, so we're going into Greg Allen right now whether we want to or not. You know, I, I, I was getting browbeaten at WFNY's comment section because Greg Allen was going to be a bad hitter, the second worst hitter in the Indians lineup. That's insane. That's from somebody who doesn't really get, and this is no rip on anyone in particular because I get how people look at statistics. Like, people don't really get Greg Allen as a hitter if you're going to say he's the second worst hitter in the lineup. I and mean, that's really assuming a lot of different things. Let's, let's look at Greg Allen real quick. Greg Allen's mentor in college was Tony Gwynn. Tony Gwynn, I, I think, Mike, Tony Gwynn could hit. I, it's just me. So his mentor is Tony so, Gwynn. And I'm, not, I'm not saying everybody's going to be Tony Gwynn. I mean, Tony Gwynn's quit, kid doesn't hit as good as Greg Allen. But when you're already a good hitter and Tony Gwynn fine-tunes your hitting, that's not a bad thing. I'm sorry, I interrupted. No, I totally agree, and I think – People have to be so sick of me saying the word contact and play discipline. Like that has to drive people crazy. But the Indians are really good at developing those dudes. And the Indians think those dudes are really important. And there's a really interesting article recently where Bill James, um, a very a relatively wise man, said that contact is one of the most undervalued things currently in Major League Baseball. And, you know, the Indians, be it Brantley, be it Lindor, be it Ramirez, uh, Chisholm in some ways, you know, they really value guys who can make a lot of contact because of the value it has. And Allen is one of those dudes. He has tremendous plate discipline. He makes a lot of contact. And he, you know, from what we understand in terms of contact authority measures in the minor leagues, he makes really good contact. So, and those are skills that are transferable. The guys that are scary at transferring to the big leagues are the ones who already strike out 22% of the time, have to ride power, and you're worried about whether the power is going to override a rising K rate when he faces better pitching. And to me, the Indians are really aggressive with guys. Yeah, things like that. But if you look at who the Indians are really aggressive with, with Ramirez and Lindor, it's guys who – can make a lot of contact because you're not going to get lost when you're in the big leagues if you're a good contact hitter. But if you bring up a guy who strikes out 25% of the time, doubles, you know, he really has issues that spike, you can break him forever. And I think Allen's the sort of guy with a profile that he's polished, but in a good way. You know, he has a major league profile as a hitter. He gets it. He can command the barrel head and he doesn't swing and miss a lot. Awesome. 
Why are we worried and, about that? And he's, and he's really a guy, too, that you have to see. And I'm not even talking about defense yet. I mean, you got to watch him in the batter's box. I mean, this isn't – this is no knock on Tyler Holt. This isn't Tyler Holt. This is a guy who commands the plate. He's aggressive, but not – in the swing like swing from your heels sort of way that Tyler Holt was, this is a legit bat. This is a guy who who understands the pitches he's looking for. You remember when we talked about Michael Brantley long before people talked about Michael Brantley that way, Mike? I like you and I have to go watch him, you know, when he's in Columbus next year uh, or Akron, when he starts off in Akron, that's probably the likely place, just so you can, you can watch him in the batter's box. So you, I, you're going to see him swing two times, and you're immediately going to see what I'm, what I'm talking about here. This guy commands the zone in a way that Cleveland have seen a few times with, with a guy, especially Michael Brantley. But, you know, Jay, Jay Ram in particular last year kind of replacing Brantley I think we're going to see that with Greg Allen as well. When you incorporate the fact that Greg Allen has 20 to 30 stolen base speed, when you take into the fact that Greg Allen quite likely, when Greg Allen is the best defender in the Cleveland Indians organization in the outfield and the second best defender overall, which is saying a lot when the first guy is Francisco Lindor, when you add that defense, you get a guy that's probably not as far away. Now, Terry Pluto came out, I think, today talking about Greg Allen. Go figure. Funny how that happens. But Greg Allen today, and, and the one thing, you know, and, and Terry Pluto, very respected member of the media, love Terry Pluto, was just on recently with Craig. The one thing he can do that we can't is talk to the Indians. And, and there's one thing that, you know, he does really well, and that's talk to the Indians. And I think he came out with a, the one piece that Greg Allen's you know, mentioned today from Mr. Pluto was that, you know, he's possibly going to be ready by July. I, this is the first person outside of us that have mentioned that. And I, and he's got some insight, Mike. I mean, do you see like all the intangibles that could make Greg Allen a viable option for the Indians in the outfield in July? And if so, how in the hell is he going to figure out a way to get onto this team when you have Al Montes and the Guyers and the, you know, the Chisholm Halls and the Naquins and, 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 you know, who knows with Brantley, like how does he maneuver and maneuver his way up onto this roster? He's not on the 40 man. You've got Zimmer in front of him. You've got Yandy Diaz in front of him. What has to happen for Greg Allen to make this roster? Um, Terry Francona has to like him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see you go in there, but that's J Ram. I mean, that was the case with J Ram, right? Yeah, I think I I think he's closer than that. If he gave me two months of continuing contact skills in Akron with the defensive reviews you get from him as an above average defender, he's ready to go. Um, and he can leapfrog dudes. That it's not hard. Uh, you know, <laughs> I I have I don't have a good comment on this to go well, I, so yeah so let's let's just say this um traditionally as much as we saw santana in the leadoff role last year you know you, you've made mention of potentially making a deal for a defensive center fielder i think maybe what francona might be looking for more and this is going to make your skin peel a little bit mike is a more traditional leadoff hitter. I mean, we saw with Rajai Davis last year, whether he was hitting or not, because of you know his intangible speed, he was a guy that was plugged into the top of the order. Mike Greg Allen, I mean, if they don't make a move, I mean, first of all, I think if they're going to make a move, they're going to be looking for a guy who can lead off. That's why Rajai Davis, to me, is a guy they'll still look at because Francona likes to lead him off. If they don't make that move, could the simple fact that Greg Allen has speed, makes good contact, and is a prototypical leadoff hitter, is that his biggest asset to Terry Francona? Because obviously, and this is, I mean, I'm not trying to knock the manager of the year, but obviously defense playing in center isn't his thing. <laughs> I mean, Michael Martinez. I mean, come on. I mean, Michael Martinez was playing center field in the ninth inning of game seven of the World Freaking Series. I mean, come yeah. on. Can we talk I, about, oh, I'm sorry. I just, I just okay. I'm, I'm can back we talk to about the least discussed giant blunder of Cleveland sports in 2016, which is 
Can I say that Terry Francona was exceptional during the playoff run? He was outstanding. I thought he was brilliant. But also, he was bad in game seven. Can we talk about that for a second? Like, when Michael Martinez is up and on the line with a world title on the line, you mismanage the game. Like, that's, that's just reality. That's life. When Brian Shaw comes out after a 30-minute rain delay, you mismanage the game. That's life. So – can we say that Francona was brilliant, but game seven was a mess? Because it was. It was a mess. It was bad managing. Anyway, I'm going to get killed for that. I hope I get tons of comments. But, it, but, it, but, but Mike, I mean, listen. I mean, I, I take – there are guys that, that bug me on this team that, that you know, and, and for good reason. There are guys that bug me on this team for bad reason. You know, Lonnie Chisenhall, everyone knows I'm much too hard on him. Thank God for Jeff Nomina because he takes all that thunder away from me. You know, Lonnie Chisholm is a serviceable player at four point whatever. You know, you have him in right field. You can't really complain about that unless you're me and especially Jeff. The two of us can put a podcast together just shredding Lonnie Chisholm. And while there is sense in that, it's somewhat, I think we definitely overdo it. Michael Martinez, there, you, I can point to every single Indians fan that I know who are either knowledgeable or not knowledgeable. And all of them come to agreement on one thing. Michael Martinez might be the worst major league player in baseball. And that's not, that's not hyperbole. So when you put him out there and you think to yourself, yeah, we won't get to him. You're going to get to him. It's the world series. Come on. I mean, uh, I don't want, I, you know, I don't know. I, I think. Too with what we've reached with managers that really bothers me that, I mean, Michael Martinez isn't just the worst player in Major League Baseball. I mean, he's one of the worst in the last hundred years. He's one of the 100 worst hitters offensively in the history of baseball. It's, it's truth. It's quantified. It's there for your reading. I'm so glad. So, I'm so glad you said that, too, because something tells me if I would have said that, it would have come off wrong. So I'm glad you said that in a very cause, caustic and calm way because he's not – I. They release him, so, and here's the bat. They release the guy, and all of us were like, okay, he's coming back. And sure enough, here he is, like a freaking cockroach. And so, like, we have to have the – it drives me crazy that we can't say, Francona was great. He made a bad decision because what happens in response is everyone's like, oh, I trust him at this point because he's made so many correct decisions, which is to say – our entire understanding of society itself. I make a lot of decisions. Some of them are wrong. If I, like everyone in, a, in their life, if they believe that they do their job really well, will admit that they made multiple bad decisions and will criticize themselves for it. So why can't we say, Francona was fantastic, but he botched game seven. And I'm not saying they would have won game seven if he made the right decisions. I'm certainly not saying that because baseball is too hard to predict, but he screwed it up. He didn't manage it well. Well, Like, can we say that? Can we admit that without me getting tarred and feather on Indians Twitter for thinking I'm smarter than a major league manager? Well, good, good, good good for you though, Mike, is I'm, I'm right there with you. And and here's the thing. And we've said this ad nauseum for the past four years that Terry Francona is the guy who, if you give him the right toolbox with the right people in that toolbox, he will outmanage you. The problem over the years has been the Indians because of you know I, financial constraints or just basically where they were on their climb to this moment just didn't have the arsenal, the weapons to use. So he had to use, you know, I, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to go down the, the pike of players of, of, of the past, you know, who've played in the outfield that he's used and utilized in some odd ways. But I think – when you have Michael Martinez in the toolbox and you don't have to, that's my problem. And, and, and in the end, you know, if you have, and I'm not even saying Yandy Diaz because we don't know what he would have done had he had been brought up in August 31st the way J-Ram was. We don't. He couldn't have been worse than Michael Martinez. Couldn't have been. Couldn't have been. I think there's and, a legitimate, by the way, there's a legitimate st- statistical argument to be made that it would have been better to pinch hit Josh Tomlin for Michael Martinez, then let Martinez sit in that situation. Talk right. about well, Michael Martinez. I, we are definitely, we are definitely running this down a rabbit hole. I want to pull away. I just, it's just so. Uh... Can I stay in there a minute? All right, go ahead. 
It's, it's our not- podcast, damn it. We'll do whatever we want, and it's Christmas. This is your Christmas. This is your Christmas joy, Mike. Go. All right. Frank Hono was fantastic, but honestly, it's really easy to manage a bullpen when Andrew Miller is throwing two elite innings every freaking appearance and Allen is throwing one. I just don't think it's that hard. So he was great. He was dynamite. Frank Hono was phenomenal, but the team was loaded. <laughs> loaded for that situation and Miller was fantastic and the other thing with Francona is that we should honor that he changed the franchise like him coming to Cleveland changed the franchise I don't see Encarnacion coming here now if Francona isn't here Um, and a lot of stuff that's happened for the past couple of years so I'm really grateful for Francona I think he's been phenomenal he's been the best manager I've ever seen in Cleveland without a doubt but he also isn't perfect and game seven was a mess I'm done Tweet at me. I don't care. Well, you know, we're going to be the podcast of nuance, Mike. I think it is conceivable that you all people aren't just great or bad at what they do. I think there is actual nuance. And if you've listened to our podcast, we kind of own that. <laughs> we have really good ones and we have some some clankers. But so far, our WFNY podcasts have been very good. I think maybe we're having the Terry Francona run right now where we'll have our occasional moments, perhaps the Michael Martinez moment, but I digress. Um, I want to talk a bit. So, so kind of wrap up this Encarnacion piece in a bow, um, throw in Greg Allen into the mix, even throw in a, a Zimmer into the mix. Um, as you look forward, Mike, you know, the, we got Encarnacion coming in after Christmas to take the physical. He'll pass that probably similar time frame is what they did with with Swisher, and they'll probably sometime around the first of the year announce the signing, have a press conference. Past that, do you see what are your percent chance that the Indians end up with a Michael Bourne like move? Again, hate bringing up that name, but you know February comes around. A team is either looking for something and the Indians have it, or there's a guy still sitting out there. Do you see the Indians doing anything else this offseason um, in a big way? And, and, and remember, Michael Bourne at the time was a big move. He was one of the bigger you know, fish out there uh, back in uh, 2012. What, what are your thoughts, Mike? I mean, you know, I know you don't want them to make a move in that you know, they are in the catbird seat, but is, is it possible – that somebody better than we're even thinking of right now presents themselves. Yeah. I think the most likely thing is one of Colorado or New York, which have really overcrowded outfields have to sell low on a guy to clear it out. And the Indians make a move that upgrades center, but isn't startlingly good. And I, I Maybe wonder I just, if, go ahead. I, no, go ahead. This is, this is their financial ceiling, right, Jim? Like, I just don't see them getting above this number. Well, what, well, here's where, I mean, here's where it gets fun. Stay at this number. Well, I mean, it's, see, here's where it gets fun because, you know, I, I, you know, I I don't know what the numbers are. I, I, I saw Terry Pluto's numbers today. He had them, I think sitting at one fifteen, with some added numbers that he wasn't taking into account. Some $500,000 guys. I have the number more close to 125, probably taking into those $500,000 contracts and some other, you know, escalations. I mean, 125 million. I don't know where that puts them as far as salary goes. I, I know it's pretty high, but this is where the fun. This is where it gets fun because you start to think about extensions and you start to think about guys like Francisco Lindor, and I, I find it impossible to believe that the Indians are going to be talking to him. I find it impossible to believe that the Indians are going to be trying to wrap up J-Ram. And if you look at the deal that the Braves signed with um, NCR Tay, you could see the Indians saying to a guy like Lindor, hey, you know, here's a six-year deal worth $35 million. And, I mean, I'm not saying he'd take that, but this seems, you know, I, I find it hard to believe they aren't going to at least head down that path. J Ram is similar, you know. I mean, I could see J Ram, you know, in that same boat, five and thirty, probably in my head, five and twenty, five to twenty, somewhere in between twenty and twenty-five for J Ram, just to kind of wrap him up and to, you know, give them maybe an extra year in the option run. But that being said, even if you do that, that doesn't really enhance this year's salary all that much. It's maybe a couple more million. So, 
So I don't think extensions cause them a problem. That being said, I mean, this you can say what you want about Antonetti. You can say what you want about Chernoff. This is an organization that is risk averse. This is, still, they're just the windows open and they don't like to spend as much money as they can. So I guess the question is, are they at their ceiling? I'd say yes. So do they make a move to shed salary? I mean, we, you know, I mean, I'm afraid to mention Chisholm Hall because people think I'm hammering on him, but I think the two obvious guys are Chisholm Hall and Shaw. I mean, do they make a move? I mean, they, they hold an incredible amount of value to the Indians and in that they save them. They're basically being paid half of what they can make on the open market. So to the Indians, they're exactly the kind of guys they want to have on this team. That being said, Chisholm Hall moving opens up the outfield a little bit and Shaw moving, you know, potentially you lose an arm that's probably seen its best days. Again, I'm afraid to say that because immediately you become a Shaw hater. It's not what I'm saying. When you pitch as much as this guy has pitched over the past four years, you're bound to see a fall off at some point. I, I mean, what percent chance that they move these guys, Mike? My creaky apartment is uh, betraying my thoughts at the moment, but – I think ultimately, Shaw. Christmas ghosts, man. If you get Christmas Shaw, ghosts, man, you got to move your so phone so I can fun. see him because that would be podcasting heaven. <laughs> so Shaw, I think, becomes so much less valuable when you have Andrew Miller. When Shaw's your seventh inning guy, I mean, he was important in that he was relatively stable for the Indians. But when he becomes your seventh inning guy, I just don't think he's worth $5 million to pitch in the seventh inning. I don't think he's good enough. And I don't think the Indians can sort of allocate $5 million to a league average pitcher in the seventh inning. This is reality. I think, on the other hand, one of the great failures of the Indians organization, which I will openly criticize, is that they've really struggled to develop relievers, and that has financial costs. I mean, they keep running these guys. We remember C.C. Lee and Austin Adams and all these guys who are supposed to be the next big thing who are pretty bad. Um, there's a long list of them. So – you know, I think ideally you'd have someone like Percy Garner or Dan Otero who you can just pay to take care of the pay to take care of the seventh and you're going to pay them less. You're going to save salary and maybe you get a small piece back or maybe you couple Shaw with something else to get something larger. Um, but to me, I think you have I think I would bet it would happen. I think it makes sense. I just think and this is another thing. This is nuance. Shaw's not a bad big league picture. He's a, he was really good last year, but he's league average getting paid more than the Indians can probably afford to pay for their seventh inning guy. And they have potential replacements that are pretty solid. So to me, the best asset allocation is to move him. Um, doesn't mean I think he sucks. I don't, but he doesn't. Well, I mean, just, fit. just financially, Mike, I mean, there isn't anybody who, there isn't anybody, whether you're an, an analytics guy or whether you're just an old school fan who can't see that Dan Otero isn't Jeff Manship, um, that Dan Otero is essentially can give you what Brian Shaw gives you. I mean, you know, and historically the seventh inning guy has been a guy like Jeff Manship. So, I mean, I, I think this is one of those areas where, you know, financially, if you're just, if you just know how to add, I mean, if you get an Otero at 2 million and I, I don't know his numbers off the top, but I, he's get right around 2 mil you get rid of the guy who does the same exact thing at five mil. If you don't have, if you have the depth to do it, I'm not even saying that the Indians do, but it seems like they do. You wrote a piece on Percy Garner earlier this year, you know, in, in a lot of ways, you know, saying that he can be a guy that can fill that role. I mean, Mike, I mean, he could be the sixth inning guy though. I mean, Dan Otero to me is the guy, you know, and, and who knows how this 10 day DL thing shakes out. And we still have to do that podcast, but you know, this could be a thing where, you know, you save money on Shaw and you have the built-in options, right? Yeah, I absolutely think so. And I mean, Otero was better last year than Shaw was. How, dare, how dare you? How? Not even close. Well, and, and, like, and while we're at it, I mean, who's going to be better in right field? Or, or, uh, okay, let, let me rephrase. Um, again, in a very similar fashion. Tyler Naquin moving to right. If you have a center field replacement, you know, if you have Naquin and you have Chisholm Hall, there's a lot of redundancy, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. So then you move the salary. I mean, again, this is just, you know, this is common basics. If you bring in an Encarnacion, it, it as a catbird seat guy in the front office, all these options become available. All right. I, I, I got to talk about the front office, Mike, because there's going to be a lot of ranting and raving. And 
And, you know, this is one of those things where, you know, over the past 48 hours, all I've been seeing on Twitter is this absolute shellacking of Mike Shapiro. And I, I or Mike Shapiro, jeez. This is where this is this is where I'm at right now. I've got Mike Chernoff and Mark Chernoff and Mark Shapiro and Mike Shapiro. I'm apparently just making people up. It's Christmas. That's what I do. Um, but you got Mark Shapiro just taking a shellacking from Indians fans as being, um, you know, the guy that held the Indians back. And and I just want to time frame this a little bit, Mike, and I'm gonna let you go off a little bit. You know, Shapiro was was a high one of. John Hart's first hires. Hart did a really nice job in the 90s, and we talked about this either in the last podcast or the one before that. John Hart's greatest probably attribute was the fact that he created this legacy uh, in the Indians front office of, of hire, really great hires. And, and Hart was really the guy that did that. You could probably even say Hank Peters for hiring Hart as that guy. Um, you know, in 01, he leaves goes to Texas and, and Shapiro takes over and it was a big deal because prior to that they had lost several you know other big guys who have gone who went to other teams because Shapiro was a guy Shapiro takes over in 2002 and prior to that you know he was in a way like Antonetti he was in the mix with a lot of other moves but really Antonetti's reign as, as the on the field guy was from 02 till somewhere in 08 you could probably make a case 208 because Antonetti was really in the mix in 08. So, so let's talk about you know Aunt, Aunt Shapiro's run, and let's talk about how quote unquote bad he was. And, and again, you know, in this nuanced day and age here at the EHC podcast, sponsored by WFNY, it's going to be okay to say a guy's good and bad at the same time because we all make bad decisions. But you know, if you look at just the time frame, Mike Anton or Shapiro comes in in 02 at the end of the era, you know, you have Tommy left from all those teams and then eventually he goes, you know, basically you've got the rebuild, which is a two or three year process that leads to 05. Then you've got the 06 disaster. Then you've got 07. Then you've got the 08 disaster and then the shakedown there. And then basically he's the team president from that point on. I mean, if you look at it that way, <laughs> just looking at it that way, we're going to get a little more into this. I mean, to me, two out of his, you know, when you take the rebuild into account, remember, we're rebuilding from the 90s team where we basically had nothing and our drafts weren't that good for a long period of time. Doesn't sound like he was that bad as the GM. That's just me. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think one of the frustrating things is we talk about Antonetti transitioning um, in 08. I mean, he was starting to get decision-making control between, like, 08 in 2011. We don't really know how much she had, which was tough. And I think people really associate from 2002 to 2011 with Shapiro, you know, for, for better or for worse. Um, but, you know, I think one of the things with Shapiro is he enters a team that's basically broken. The Indians have one year of contention left, maybe. And then they have to blow it up. And he was responsible enough to blow it up, you know, which takes a lot of courage and being hired for that role. And I do want to say in Toronto, I think that's exactly what he was hired to do. The ownership in Toronto is notoriously cheap compared to their market size in a really expensive division. Um, and I think he was hired in to butcher it and build the organization like the Indians. And I think that's because people trust him to build an organization with really good minds and really good staff. And he's not necessarily there to make the correct baseball move his first two years. He's there to build the staff of 10, 15 people in player development, um, and scouting and drafting um, that can move the organization forward for the next 10 years. And I think if you look at him in that context, um, I think Antonetti is easily one of the 10 best GMs in baseball. I think he's fantastic. The Indians have recently moved into being one of the five to seven best drafting teams in baseball, which, you know, he and, and Antonetti helped build. Their player development system is really highly regarded. You know, you look at guys like Clevenger, who note, you know, how much better player development is for him once he moved to Cleveland versus being in the Angel system, which is one which has a lot more money in it. Um, so I think, from that perspective, you know, there were, there were decisions he made, the Kerry Wood decision 
Phillips decision, Brandon Phillips trade, you know, there were some messy decisions in there. And I don't think he was a great. Those, those were messy though. Those were messy for a variety of reasons. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, I, the wood thing was one of those where they needed to get a guy and there weren't that, that any guys out there and wood was the guy, you know I mean? They, they made that move and, and he had never been the closer before. So, so that, that move in and of itself and, and the whole Brandon Phillips thing, I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's another rabbit hole to get into at some point, but you know, that was, that was more or less, you know, I mean, wasn't that a man, I mean, that was a management thing. That was a on the field manager thing. I think that, that, you know, Shapiro was trying to figure out, but I mean, I didn't mean to interrupt there, Mike, but yeah, I, I, I agree a hundred percent. I think there are bad moves in there, but so many good ones. I mean, if you look at, you look at the early part of his reign, the guy, you know, the Hafter moves and the Broussard bringing him in and, and some of the other moves. I mean, he, he's made some, you know, Shin Su Chu, fantastic moves over the years. He really did a phenomenal job spotting talent and then turning over talent for more talent. And I think the industry is not always smart. And this just may be an appeal to authority and a a logical fallacy. But I think there's a reason that he was a hot, hotly chased GM during almost his entire time in Cleveland by larger markets. There's a reason that the Blue Jays were happy to move on from someone who was beloved in Toronto to move to Shapiro to build this baseball ops and and run baseball ops. And I think also when the industry regards you um, and you do okay in a small market, maybe we shouldn't butcher Shapiro as badly as he's butchered. So and I get the criticisms. He wasn't great. He wasn't perfect, but he wasn't bad. And, um, Life is too complex to just say, oh, or he's during his tenure, he wasn't that good. I mean, it's, it's just too complex to do that. Oh, and I, I mean, his ability, I think, over the, you know, and I mean, we can, I don't want to necessarily dive down this, but, you know, you look at a guy like, you know, Bob Howry, who in 05 was kind of an avant-garde reliever for the Indians, who they sign and, you know, Shapiro goes out, gets him. He has an amazing year and, you know, they, he ends up flipping that into a major deal after that at the age of 31. You know, you can run down a whole slew of the Kevin Millwood signing. I mean, he, you know, you can you can talk about not being aggressive all you want. However, and, and Antonetti clearly has a more aggressive side to him than Shapiro ever had. But Shapiro was in his front office organization, which included Antonetti, did a really, really good job of finding those diamonds in the rough cultivating them and then basically making them too expensive for the Indians to keep at the time. So, you know, at the, at the very least, Mike, don't you think that that Shapiro's really kind of golden asset as a general manager was finding the guys who had those market inefficiencies and making them efficient. And I think, you know, finally you pointed this out before we got on the pod, but you know, he, he took a step back when he realized that Antonetti was better suited to the role, which is really important. I think he did a phenomenal job sort of prepping Antonetti's talent and then saying, here you go, you have the reins. I'm going to worry about, you know, business operations. And also, you know, the corner is pretty cool. Does everybody hate the corner? (laughs) Like, Love the corner. It's really fun to go to progressive for a game right now. There's awesome vendors. The corner is a blast. It's a fun atmosphere. And so he really overhauled that. And so you can complain about that too. That's fine. But I don't know. Mm. Cleveland loves it. So. Well, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, you know, he brings in, you know, and he, you know, this is not an Antonetti move. You know, he brings in Terry Francona and, and, you know, we've talked about the ups and downs with Francona over the years, but Francona really signified, and this was, you know, this was based on their friendship, you know, for many, many years before. And I'm not saying Antonetti and Francona aren't friends too. I think that's been underplayed uh, over the past couple of seasons. But I think that, you know, that Francona move signified a shift in many different ways. And Shapiro was probably the one who was able to kind of curtail Francona into coming in. So at the end of the day, though, the whole shift in this franchise happened with Francona. And if Edwin, if if the simple end game of that was that Edwin and Carnacion came to the Cleveland Indians, um, obviously that was something that that bared a lot of fruit. So I don't know. I mean, you can everybody has guys they want, everybody has guys they don't like. 
to me, I think Shapiro's the biggest negative about Shapiro is that he came after a guy who is so beloved in this town and John Hart because of those 90s teams that, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of like, uh, I don't even, I almost said something that was going to fire you up. I won't. It, I almost went political. Okay. It, it, but I, I just, oh. go ahead. Can we talk about the fact that John Hart was phenomenal, but at the end, you know, I think there's this sort of belief that like when John Hart left, contention left because he wasn't there anymore. And those teams were really old. I mean, they kept, you know, sort of built when they go get Juan Gon and and Almar post-prime. They bring in a bunch of post-prime players or near the end of their prime players. They gutted the system in deals that weren't that great. I mean, he also dealt away Brian Giles and, and a few other pretty good players had starting pitching um, to a point where the system was pretty barren was in, and you have everybody in their late thirties. I mean, there was just no real route to them continually contending for another 10 years. Um, and I think Shapiro sort of unfortunately reviled for the reality that people don't grasp. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, again, you know, this is, I, it's easy to, you know, I mean, we, we win on the Edwin and Carnacion thing and perhaps are catching some flack, uh, in, in Toronto right now because of their loss of, of several, you know, free high price free agents. But I mean, at the end of the day, he's kind of, you know, the one thing that he had to do was, you know, four, I think it was four years ago now that, or maybe it was three, the blue Jays, if you remember the, the blue Jays went all in, they, they were making trades and bringing in guys and signing guys to ridiculous contracts and bringing knuckleballers in at some ungodly amounts of money. Um, I think part of what Shapiro was brought in to do was to clean that mess up. And, you know, I mean, when I say mess, I mean, obviously they've made some fantastic deals right prior to Shapiro. They got Josh Donaldson and, you know, obviously, you know, Encarnacion has really paid out and he's been there for a while though, but you know, you got a guy like Batista who's really played out and, you know, but it's one of those things where, you know, you know, you got this franchise in Toronto that, Encarnacion early, he said no. They offered him a big deal. He said no, and they just decided to do their own thing. Message sent. I mean, that's the way Shapiro's are, all, always really ran, run his teams as a GM. He was a guy who signed guys earlier rather than later. Um, Antonetti's just a little bit different. So I think I think we're all glad Antonetti's here. We still have that fantastic front office. We still have a fr- fantastically analytical front office. And with Antonetti and, and now Chernoff, we have guys who clearly are willing to – Spend the money when they have the money to spend. Here's the question, and we're not going to answer it now because we still have to play baseball games. The question is, is will Edwin Encarnacion make that $20 million worthwhile? Um, I'm curious, Mike, to find out you know, what the numbers are um, as far as attendance goes. Will we get a bop in attendance thanks to this? I'm sure you'll have a piece out soon maybe talking about that. But I think this Encarnacion deal is going to fold over in several different ways. Uh, makes Antonetti in that front office look really good. It's going to make this team look really good on the field. And uh, it's going to be fun to kind of see where we go from here. Will we make another move? Don't know. But right now we've got a team that's a World Series bound team. And we are loaded for bear as long as we stay healthy. So the only question mark we have right now is Michael Brantley and how that outfield shakes out. Whew, man, I don't know. I, at least now we can start our uh, positional previews, huh? Yeah, thank heavens. Thank heavens. <laughs> you know what we ought to do, though? We ought to just take the outfield one from last year and just do it again. Just I might as well just regurgitate that because it's the same exact thing. And we're talking about the same guys, just no Rajai Davis. And well, maybe, maybe Rajai right Davis. And maybe Rajai Davis. What's he signed for? What did we pay him last year, like four and a half? What do we get him now, like for him. one and two? <laughs> I think it'd be five again. Somewhere around five. I'm, I really <laughs> want to see what the Napoli deal looks like because, like, I think everybody thinks he, like, rebuilt his value because of the dingers, but, like, teams are scared out of their minds of Mike Napoli's strikeout issues at this point. It's a one-year – I mean, he's signing the exact same deal. Like, right? I, one year? I wonder if he gets, like, one or two million more guaranteed, but I doubt any organization is foolish enough to give him two years. But best well, so that's the anyway. thing. So if you get one and nine, they probably don't put in the things that got him to 10 this year. Yeah. So does he make more? No. Um, 
he doesn't because he's a year older and he basically fell off the cliff last year. So I say no, but I, I don't know if we're allowed to say that about him because, you know, he's got quirky sayings and things, but I digress. I'm going to cut that out because I'm going to catch a lot of hell for that. <laughs> All right, Mike, we're going to close up shop here. Uh, great talk about Edwin Encarnacion. We'll be back in the next, in the coming new year with positional previews. Those things will be, those pre previews will be coming out once or twice a week. And we will be up updating those as the Indians kind of go through spring training and perhaps get another signing or two. Uh, the one last thing I do want to say here, Mike, and we didn't get into this. And I, 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 you asked me a question that's been perplexing to me. And, and this, this is not a joke. This is totally serious. You asked me a question kind of offhandedly, you know, I was driving to North Carolina on Thursday and you said, what's best, their outfield, their bullpen or their rotation? And I honestly had a thought initially, but as I sit here two days later, I honestly can't answer that. I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I want to say the rotation and then I, I, I think about Andrew Miller, and then I want to say the bullpen. And I think about all the pieces that they can add there. And then I think about this lineup, and I think, man, the lineup, if it develops, and if we get some guys that come up, the lineup could be something that we haven't seen in 20 years. I, I, I guess, what's your question? I mean, kind of to close out the show here, what do you think? Like, what, what's their best asset right now? Yeah, I asked that question because I think it's like now impossible to decide. And I think that's awesome. You know, this was a team where we we're like, oh, I hope the starting pitching, like if we don't have any starting pitching injuries, we're like the best team in baseball or something. And now it's like, yeah, like we probably have the best bullpen in baseball now. And uh, we have a top five lineup. So maybe I just don't think the rotation is the best part of this team anymore. And I think that's sort of been our identity for the last few years. Um, but I think the bullpen is probably the best unit. I think the lineup and the rotation probably tie. Um, you know, these are three really awesome units. And this is a team that's not built around starting pitching anymore, which is awesome because the Indians have some starting pitchers with huge injury risk. And depth is going to be pretty key this year. We have no idea who Danny Salazar is going to be. And I hope it's Danny Salazar, but I'm really worried. So not – not riding solely on the arms of pitchers who have had Tommy John surgery is something that makes me a little happier. Well, and when you think about the Indians offense, the funny thing to, to really ponder is that while a lot of people are talking about regression for guys like J Ram and, and even Lindor to me, and again, this is for a podcast down the line. I think you have opportunity for not regression, I, I mean, I don't know that we've seen who J Ram really is yet. I mean, obviously we got a really good picture of it last year, but you know, I think when you start making comps to some other guys, you know, major league baseball right now have similar skill sets uh, you start thinking, you know, maybe while he could have been the MVP for the Indians last year, you could see a guy like J Ram start to develop into an MVP candidate with the skill set that he has and the confidence that he has. And as he gets more and more, I mean, we're talking about a 24 year old guy and Lindor in the same boat. Um, you know, we have offensive upside, uh, especially in a year where Jason Kipnis was just pretty good all year. You know, I mean, even if he regresses, a, even if he regresses a little bit and he'd be the guy I'd be worried about, you know, as far as those infield guys go, I think that, you know, I think our offense is just going upward. Um, and, and that's kind of the fun conversation, especially when you start thinking about Yandy Diaz, Greg Allen, and a guy even like Zimmer, who will strike out maybe 50% of the time if he gets called up, but that's for another day. All right. We're going to close things up. Uh, thanks for listening. Ha Merry Christmas to everybody. If you hear this before Christmas, during Christmas, and if you hear this after Christmas, well, happy new year. Uh, we'll see you on the flip side sometime next week, starting with our positional previews. And Mike, I think we're going to start off with your favorite position. Ah, this is sarcasm. No, it's not. Your one of your favorite positions to talk about. I think this off season is going to be catcher. And that's where we're going to start. So we'll be taking a look at Jan Gomes. We'll be taking a look at Roberto Perez. We'll be talking about who's going to start and where this conversation was kind of boring last year. Oh, it's interesting now, isn't it? Who's going to start more games at catcher next year? Jan Gomes or Roberto, Roberto Perez? Perez? Conversation's over. <laughs> and let the debate. Let the debate. There's nothing like throwing something out as a hook and then having 
ha- before I get it out as the hook, Mike ruins my surprise. All right. Until then, <laughs> Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. We'll see you soon.